Hello everyone and welcome to the Arbitrator Intelligence Africa Campaign 2020 interview series. My name is Kathleen Bofu, a legal practitioner in Zimbabwe and co-chair of the 2020 Arbitrator Intelligence Africa Campaign. Arbitrator Intelligence is a global information aggregator that collects and analyzes critical information about arbitrator decision making in order to produce reports that parties and their lawyers can use when researching arbitrators. By increasing access to critical information about arbitrators and their decision making, arbitrator intelligence uses innovative data analytic analytics to promote transparency, accountability, and diversity in arbitrator, to, arbitrator selection. With me here today is Dr. Mohammed Abdel Wahab. Dr. Abdel Wahab, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. It's a great pleasure to join you today. I'm delighted to be uh, to be interviewed by you uh, for the Arbitrator Intelligence, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now to get into the interview, um, you are currently partner and head of international arbitration at Zulfikar and Partners, vice president of the ICC International Court of Arbitration, and one of the leading arbitration practitioners on the continent. How did you get into the field of arbitration? Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, uh, uh, yes, I have my uh, both academic and professional hats uh, uh, as well. None of, of course, the views I express now are attributed to any of the institutions or firms I'm affiliated with. But uh, your question is a very interesting one, uh, which is how did I get into international arbitration? Now, let me give you a background. Since sixth grade at school, uh, I wanted to enter the legal field and I felt that um, my mindset is set on the law and becoming a, a legal uh, practitioner of sorts. Um, and it was during university, during my readings, although arbitration was not being taught, uh, that I felt that arbitration is something that I want to do. Um, highly contentious, high adrenaline type of uh, work, uh, very... Uh, challenging, very innovative, uh, and, and this was to me um, appealing, I have to say. Um, how did I get into that? I was, um, I finished my studies, I did my master's, I was doing my PhD in England, and uh, I was sitting one day there and deciding how can I enter the field of arbitration? And at the time it was, the world was not as open as it is today. Um, arbitration was more of a, uh, international arbitration at least, more of a closed community. Um, and uh, it was not easy to get into or penetrate. So I thought that I must have an edge, something that uh, may not be of interest to many, uh, that would give me an edge into arbitration. And that's how I got to uh, start my career and, and working with, on online dispute resolution and technology uh, related disputes. Um, and that was the entry point. So I became gradually uh, known for as an arbitrator or you know, counsel work in relation to technology related disputes and uh, the understandings of online dispute resolution. And uh, in fact, my very first appointments included sitting on tribunals with engineers in relation to telecommunications, information technology. So that was my entry point through technology, which information communication technologies, which now is not only a buzzword, but a reality we're living in. So I think I, I, that was the edge through which I entered the arbitration world. I think you're on mute. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And having had so much experience with the international arbitration world, what would you say is your favorite aspect about international arbitration? It's a very interesting question. Uh, let me say two things, actually. It's complexity. Um, I like that the substantive aspects and its complexity, of course. Uh, the procedural innovation there in arbitration, but most importantly, uh, the distinctiveness of arbitration on a case-by-case -case basis. Cases are different, even though sectors may be the same. Uh, you hear counsel from different parts of the world, different arguments, different views. 
this is the part that I like about arbitration a lot, is that you don't get bored with arbitration. It has this distinctive feature to it. Okay, that's, that's very interesting. I'm sure a lot of arbitration practitioners would agree regarding the distinctiveness of arbitration um, as, a field, as a field to practice. And having participated in over 200 arbitrations administered by different institutions, what would you say are some of the things that African institutions need to be doing in order to gain more vis visibility and increase their caseload? Again, an excellent question, Kathleen. I'm very grateful for it. Let me say the following. Now I think on the continent, there are some good institutions. And in fact, they go beyond the characterization as domestic and even some have made it regional and others have also acquired uh, the international reputation that is deserved. My advice to institutions uh, on the continent would be three. Independence, you need to maintain your independence as an institution, uh, irrespective of the uh, territory you're in. Um, you have to maintain that independence if you want to make it as an institution, a trustworthy institution. Secondly, competence. Uh, you need to have competence, proper case management, uh, proper case managers as councils, uh, well trained into the intricacies of international arbitration, because that is, again, how you gain the trust and confidence of the users. And thirdly, the international approach that institutions have to take. Align themselves with um, international best practices, because uh, that is the way then, then these institutions can cater for the needs of users and acquire uh, a, a proper place amongst uh, institutions uh, regionally and worldwide. So independence, competence, and international approach. Okay, great. Um, I think that's some good advice for the most of the institutions that will be listening um, to, this, to this video. Now, moving on to the actual arbitrator appointments. Do you feel like these appointments are diverse in practice? Uh, well, increasingly so. Uh, they are increasingly getting diverse, though not enough and we're not yet there. And definitely not on the basis of cultural, ethnic background. Uh, we have made leaps in relation to gender diversity and more remains to be done. Uh, but on the cultural, age-wise, I think we have a lot more to do. Uh, so I find that we are still on our way, but we are moving in that direction. Okay. And what are some of the changes that you've noticed um, in your area of expertise that are sort of assisting this change in creating more and more diversity? Um, I think people are becoming more and more conscious and well-versed in arbitration to try and go beyond the usual uh, names that comes to mind when you have a case to consider to do more research about uh, qualified arbitrators. We have to understand as well that arbitration is not uh, an area of trial and error. So no party would want to get their appointment wrong because if you get your appointment wrong, maybe, well, no amount of good lawyering can rectify that. So you need to get it right. And to do that, you need to have uh, done your proper research about the arbitrators uh, and about who to choose for the specific case. And there are many qualified people across the globe and many more in the pipeline. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's not uh, an easy decision to make, but certainly something that uh, uh, the users would need to consider carefully. And what has been done so far is that you see more platforms, more visibility uh, to arbitrators. Institutions, for example, have done an excellent job in terms of, uh, 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 well, let's say, uh, having new blood into the arbitration system. They have taken bold moves, institutions across the globe, uh, both in commercial and investment arbitration. And I think the parties have not yet lived up to the expectations of the system in relation to diversity. And I think uh, more work needs to be done uh, in this respect so that we achieve a, um, an acceptable level of diversity uh, globally. Okay, and you've, spoken, you've just spoken about um, conducting your research 
on arbitrators. Have you generally found it easy or difficult to access information on other arbitrators when you have been faced with a case where you had to participate in arbitrator appointments? That's a very good uh, point. Let me distinguish this by saying in, in, our, in my early years of practice, uh, definitely it wasn't easy because you don't know many people. Uh, you're not yet familiar with the arbitration arena. Uh, but gradually over the years, you become, you know, you know many people. It's, there is word of mouth. There is feedback about people who have seen X in action or sitting as an arbitrator. So it becomes easy. Though, that's why my answer is, it is both difficult and easy. Difficult because you don't have immediately available information or um, place that you can go to right away and get um, enough sufficient information that make you take a decision without knowing the person. Uh, still, there are some useful tools, there are some useful databases, and firms normally have their own list of uh, uh, arbitrators. But I mean, the, the transparent uh, exchange or availability of these databases or uh, tools publicly, and uh, not just the availability, ensuring that they are reliable is another level. Uh, you create an aura of trust and confidence. And to do that, so far, the trust and confidence is not just simply based on names, CVs, platforms, or tools. There is an element of going around and asking uh, those in your circle of trust whether they have heard of X or Y, and whether that person, uh, be it he or she, um, is a good arbitrator. So still we are relying to an extent on the human element uh, in terms of uh, uh, interactive discussions and communications. Um, so to that extent, it may not be an easy thing, but I recognize there are uh, tools, including arbitration intelligence and other tools, uh, that may offer more visibility and transparency to qualified uh, arbitrators. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And now, if you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about the current practice of international arbitration, what would that be? It's a, it's a tough question. To change one thing in the practice of arbitration. Well, since you've given me one wish, which is the magic wand to change one thing, I would use the wand, if possible, to change the minds of people in relation to arbitration. So if I can use the wand, to change how people think of international arbitration, I would have achieved much because then this would transform the practice of international arbitration, not just in one aspect, uh, across the board, uh, to align it with the expectations of the users, council, uh, institutions, arbitrators, all stakeholders, and make the leap into the future. Because I think that the practice of international arbitration is destined for a change. We've seen that with COVID-19. And this change is not across or in relation to one aspect. Uh, it is going to be across the board. Uh, there isn't much visibility yet where we will stand in a couple of years. But the certainty is that there will be a change. And that's that, that change will be substantial. So if I'm going to use the one for one thing is to open up people's minds uh, and eyes to see the myriad of opportunities and prospects that the arbitration practice can achieve. So changing the minds of people will help us change the practice. 